So we're going to start this segment because this section is about is talking about the three, the three, uh, not chapter three. This is session three life insurance policies. And these are the policies that we're going to talk about. This is a summary. This is an overview of what we're going to discuss for the next 40 minutes. And I like to compartmentalize things and put things into kind of like chunks of information, right? So if you notice right below life insurance policies that you, the first, poli the first category is traditional policies. And under the traditional policies, we have three. We have whole life, endowment, and term insurance. Do you all see that? And then there's some key points for term. And then the next category are flexible policies. Now, the traditional policies, I'm just gonna give you a quick intro before I we go into each one of them. But the traditional policies are the ones that have been around forever in a day, right? Everybody knows about whole life, everybody knows about term and endowment. But the more recently developed products, and when I say recently developed, I'm talking about like back in the 1980s. So in the 1980s, they introduced a type of flexible policy called universal life. So I'm giving you a little history here. So everything in the whole life and term, everything is fixed. The company is telling you, they're structuring the policy. They control everything in the contract. When you get into the flexible policies and we talk about universal life, universal life has flexibility in both premium and face amount. Where are they flexible? Where's the flexibility in? What is it? Premium and face amount. Thank you. Premium and face amount. They're flexible. And we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Now, I know how it reads universal life variable, universal life variable twice. That's a typo. One of those variables, got, you have to put a line through it. Because it should read universal life and then universal variable universal life. And then you have the equity, in, uh, equity index universal life. I actually have to, I don't know what happened here. This is really weird. I think it's a formatting issue over here when I turn it to PDF. You know, mine, so doesn't like, have, mine doesn't have the word variable twice. It doesn't? No, it, it says universal life, uh -huh. variable universal life, yes. variable life, yes. equity index life. That's Thank what I you. see too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's the way it should be. Thank you, Rebecca. I, so then it was a formatting in the, when I PDF the document. Um, going into PowerPoint, I don't know, it's kind of weird. Uh, but, but and then the the last one you do need to make a correction because that should read equity index universal life so it's an iul you can put iul in parentheses so the last one should read equity index universal life the nickname is uh, uil um, iul pardon me iul index universal life okay and in that so then so we had the universal life was introduced and then slowly from that they introduced the variable products which is the piece that you mentioned earlier rebecca where they're right. taking like an element of investing in the stock market, stock market, and then wrapping it in a life insurance product, right? right. So that the internal growth of the cash value, which we'll talk about later, um, is going to keep up with inflation by investing in mutual funds. And then that would require that you go on to get further licensing, which you, you and Vicky would go on to get, because in order to sell the variable products, it's not enough to just be life agent licensed. You also need to go on and get FINRA registered and get your securities licensed. And that's a whole separate training and class. And then we have the special purpose policies. And the special purpose policies, these are the, I always say, the way I describe the special purpose policies is that they are the traditional policies with a specific need in mind. So we have the family policy, joint life, second to die, last to die, also known as survivorship life, and then juvenile policy. So this is an overview of what we're gonna talk about in the next 30, we're gonna get as, as much as I can done in the next 30 minutes, because I wanna honor your time and give you that break between um, now and that two o'clock session, okay? So, oh, pardon me. And you have the notes for the rest of this stuff, but um, the bottom part of this page here, let me shrink this back up. These are basically the characteristics of the um, of the different policies, like the key elements. I'm going to take that and I'm going to talk about it on the board and go over it with you. Okay. Okay. So let me stop sharing here. Stop share, and I'm going to go back to the whiteboard. So the first.
first product we're going to talk about, and I always like to, I like to talk about a term first. It's the easiest, it's the simplest to understand, but I want to go back to some foundation stuff. And when it comes to life insurance products, one of the things you want to determine, is it a temporary need or is it a permanent need? Because there's a difference between temporary and permanent, right? Temporary, when you think of the word temporary, what is that usually referring to? It's for what? A limited time. Time. Temporary is for limited time. At some point, it's going to run out or expire, right? And the product that we offer as a life insurance product for temporary coverage is called term. What's it called? Term. term. So term is temporary. Term is temporary. All you're doing is you're buying time. And it provides um, pure protection. Now, the reason that we say that it provides pure protection is because there's no cash value. No what? Cash value. Cash value. There's no cash value. All you're buying is protection. No cash value. Pure protection. That's it. And there's three different types of term. And the reason for no cash value is because all you're doing is there's no cash accumulation inside of the contract. So there's three types of term. You have a level term. You might have a decreasing term. And you might have an increasing term. We're not going to talk about increasing. We'll just talk about level. We'll talk about level and decreasing term. That's it. And so with the level term, it, it's talking about the face amount. The face amount is the level of coverage that you buy. So if you have a $500,000 term policy on a level term, that means that from beginning to end, right, regardless of when the insurer dies, the face amount stays the same out, same, and the payout stays the same. Everybody got that? So whether they die the first year, the fifth year, or the 10th year, it doesn't matter. So you, there's different types of level terms, right? You might have like an annual renewable term. You may have a five year, 10 year, 20 year, 30 year term. These are the different types of terms that you can buy, right? And the number of years, basically that's the length of time that you have coverage for. So if you have a 20 year term, how long are you gonna get coverage for? 20 years. What happens at the end of the 20 years? You have the option in some policies to renew or to convert to whole. Yes, thank you. So it expires, right? So it expires at the end of the term. If it expires, there's no coverage, but some of them have an option, just like Rebecca said, for um, guaranteed renewable. If it goes into guaranteed renewable, what happens is that it will continue the coverage but what happens to the premium every year? It increases. It increases. So the guaranteed renewable feature in the um, term allows for the policy owner, allows policy owner to continue coverage. Would that be considered a rider? No, it's usually a feature. Uh, it's a feature, okay. Yeah, you might you want to make sure that the you want to read the policy provisions or just it'll tell you like if it's renewable or non-renewable. If it's renewable, then it'll it'll tell you in the on the policy base, and it'll also if you read the contract, it'll tell you what the premium is going to be if you decide to exercise your guaranteed renewable option. Mm -hmm. The premium goes up significantly because you have to remember they're taking the average mortality risk for those twenty years, for example, and as you know, the mortality risk is an upward curve, right? So every year I get older, what happens to my premium? It's going up. Yeah, it's increasing, right? It's increasing. And, and so if I buy my policy today, they're taking the mortality risk for that period of time. But at the end of, of the, when the policy expires, if I go into annual renewable, every year the I get older, the premium is gonna go up. Does that make sense? Now, if I decide I want you know, to extend for another, let's say I buy a, another 20 year term, what's gonna happen to my premium? It's gonna go up again. But see all the premiums I paid for my first term expired. I get nothing out of it, that's it. So I'm basically restarting and then they're gonna evaluate the mortality risk. And then again, it expires and if I wanna continue coverage, I can continue under the guaranteed renewable but what happens is my premium is going to go up for that year because they're taking the mortality risk for that one year. 
That has to be chosen when you buy the term, whether or not you are going to buy a term with a guaranteed renewable or? It's part of the, it's the way the contract is structured. Most policies oh, are renewable and convertible. Oh, it's not something you have to check the box and choose? No, it's a common feature in okay. most policies. Okay. It's a common characteristic in most term policies that they're going to be guaranteed renewable and convertible. But you've got to read the contract, Rebecca. That's really important. Especially if the premium is really, really affordable and you're older, because it might be non-renewable. It might not have the convertible feature to it. It's always a good idea to read the, the contract, but a common characteristic and feature is that they're guaranteed renewable and that they're convertible. Right. Okay. So guaranteed renewable, going back here, allows the policy to continue coverage without EOI, without evidence of insurability, meaning without medical. I was about to ask. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so continue coverage without evidence of insurability. And what happens to the premium? Premium increases. Yeah, but why does the premium increase? Because your mortality rate increases. Because you're older. Because you're older. You're more likely to die. <laughs> yes. Uh, let me see. Oh, here we go. Now, these policies, like we said, or like um, Rebecca had earlier described, are also, we're going to have to throw this one away, are convertible. What are they? Convertible. Can you read, the, can you see the orange? Yeah. Yeah. They're convertible. I missed my policy conversion. You missed the conversion? Yep. All right. So here we have our, now what does the convertible allow for? Give her a happy. So it allows the policy owner to exchange. They get to trade in their policy. So it allows the policy owner to exchange, now check this out, from term to perm. Permanent, right? From term to perm, meaning permanent without EOI, evidence of insurability, and premium is based on attained age. Premium is based on attained age. What is attained age? Your current age? Yes, at the time that you convert, at the time that you exchange, exactly. So again, allows the policy to exchange from term, anytime there's a convertible option or you have a convertibility um, privilege like in group insurance it always it's always related to trading in from term to perm from term to what term. Term. Term, term all right now you see this woman here she's driving a convertible and she's got a perm because That's women who have you don't want to trick to remember women who have long hair and drive convertibles they need to get a perm otherwise their hair gets messed up so always think of term to perm all right <laughs> you like that Rebecca <laughs> yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> All right, so that's your convertible option. And for group insurance, how many days do you have to convert? 31 days. So what's the conversion for group? 31 days. 31 days for group life. So Rebecca, let's say you're working for a company and then um, you decide to go work for another company and they have life, they offered you life insurance. You have a conversion that, you have a convertibility privilege where you could take it with you if you want to. You have 31 days to exercise that right and they're gonna trade you from term to term. Okay. But what's the disadvantage of that is that if you're healthy, guess what? They're allowing you to convert without evidence of insurability. So they're going to forego the medical questionnaire. If they do that, they're, they're already presupposing that you might be a higher risk. So the premiums might be a little higher. So it might be better to go out and get an individual plan than to convert if you're so healthy. If you're not healthy, then it makes sense to take it with you because there's no medical. Mm -hmm. Got it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, let me see. Any questions? Now, I'm glad you mentioned that you you missed the convert the convertibility option, or you missed the window, because in, with the individual plan, there is a window. You have to read the contract. The contract will tell you how long you have to convert. If you don't convert within that period of time, then you miss the conversion. Okay. 
So it's not like if I have a 20 year term, I can convert for 20 years. Um, I've seen a contract that had a 10 year, it was a 10 year term with a five year conversion option. So if you don't exercise it by the fifth year, guess what? You missed out on that conversion option. You gotta read the contract and know your product is at. Um, any questions? I have a student who's like getting into the business right now during COVID-19 and, uh, and he's saying like, you know, hey, people, you know, they don't have money right now. They're out of work. And I said, they have a family. They have a mortgage, right? They have people to protect. Start them with term. You can start them with term. Start them with term. They're paying the least amount of premium they could possibly pay. Get them something because then when they're, they have, when things are settled and they're back to work and they're earning an income again, guess what? They can do what? Convert. convert. They can convert. Because what happens right now, see, remember I said uh, last week that you buy life insurance with your health and then you pay with your premium. So lock them in and qualify them for the coverage now because who knows what's going to happen? What if they, they do end up with the COVID-19? What if they do end up sick or something happens, right? At least you lock in the insurance and then later when they make any more money, then you can convert them to a permanent policy. Because initially, term is the most affordable and it's the cheapest. But if you're looking for, because I started with temporary versus, I didn't put this up here, versus permanent. If you want permanent coverage, guess what? Term is, term is a good place to start, but you're not going to want to keep it because it becomes the most expensive over time because of this mortality curve, right? What happens as we get older, the cost of insurance goes up. So if you want something that's permanent, you're going to want the whole life or universal life or some other permanent protection, right? Because the whole life, for example, and for the purpose of the exam, for what purpose? For the purpose of the exam. Yeah. Your whole life is to age 100. Mm -hmm. And so they're going, remember 100. Every, anytime you see whole life, you think of what age? 100. 100. <clears throat> because they're going to take the average mortality risk from when you buy it to age 100. The younger you buy it, the more time you have to spread out that mortality cost, right? Which keeps the premium down. And the other feature of the whole life policy is that it has cash value and that cash value For premium. Yeah. You're not going to, uh, you're not going to lose the coverage, right? right. You're going to pay a separate premium for that because okay. you're taking a part of it and then you're exchanging it for, uh, for whole life. Okay. But the benefit of the term, there's a, there's a couple of different benefits for the term, right? Uh, you've got, so here's some keywords that you need to know, right? Uh, it's ideal for a low income and high insurance. Because right? you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck. Uh, it is the most affordable. And when you buy it, you're locking in your insurability, right? You're locking in your insurability. Because in the future, your, your, your health isn't guaranteed. Who knows what's going to happen? And so at least buying this term now, you're locking in the coverage. Any questions? It's the easiest to understand. A lot of people buy term. A ton of people buy term. Why? Because it's affordable. But see, let me share something with you. Um, I'm pausing because I'm going to edit this piece out. If you look for it, you can find it on the internet. Out of all of the term written in the U.S., what percentage actually gets paid out in a debt benefit? What percentage actually gets paid out in a debt benefit? Out of all of the term written in the U.S.? Two percent. How much? Two. You're so smart, Rebecca. Two percent. Why only two percent? Because they expire while the person's still living, most of these policies. Well, yes, and... People buy the policies when they're young and they keep it when they're young, right? Because it's cheap. But, and they're less likely to die because they're lower on the mortality curve. When they're older and they're more likely to die, it becomes unaffordable and too expensive for them. And then they don't keep it. Does that make sense? Or they don't have it. They, they can't buy into it because their health no longer allows them, no longer qualifies them to buy the coverage. So I'm not saying that people in their 70s and 80s and 60s don't buy term. They, can certainly by term, but the question is at what cost and can they qualify for it if they're in poor health, right? So, you know, I think it's a little bit short-sighted in the planning when people think like, I'll buy term and then I'll accumulate all my assets, especially in times like this when we've had like so much uncertainty 
I mean, it wasn't that long ago that we went through the Great Recession. It was only 10 years ago, like, you know, 10, 12 years. What started in 2007, the range is like 2008, 2009. We recovered from that. Now we're on the COVID-19. And who knows what's going to happen next, right? And people who had, who were heavily invested in equities back in the Great Recession, if they pulled their money out and didn't wait for the, the to take the ride back up, they will never recover from those losses, ever. They can't can't because the kind of recovery and the time that we need for that we have to go through another great recession in order for them to get their money back up so again like if this, this is my personal opinion i think it's short-sighted when people think like oh i'll buy term and then i'll save my money and then i'll have something to leave behind for my, my family but see the benefit of life insurance is it avoids probate it pays out as soon as the person dies and it's tax-free and it's available there when people need the money the most and they don't have to worry about waiting for probate. They don't have to worry about the distribution of the assets. They have the money so that they can grieve the loss now and then take whatever step is necessary, whatever next step is necessary. Um, and this is not only true for like when you have a young family, but if you're married and then you retire and then you lose, when one of, if, if you're on, so if you have social security income coming in, guess what? You're gonna lose one of those benefits when the people, when the person dies. Because you don't get both after the person dies, you go down to one social security benefit, right? And then whatever pension plans or whatever benefits they have, if that's locked into them and then they die, you're gonna lose that income too. So, you know, from my perspective, life insurance, you need permanent protection because you don't know what's gonna happen with life, right? You have no idea what's gonna happen. And it's better to buy it when you're young, even if it's a small policy because something, some cushion, some foundation is better than no foundation at all. Okay, so I'm done because I'm going to pause here because I'm going to edit that part out. <laughs> that 2% thing, you know, people are like, what? 2%? That's all. Yeah, because people buy it when they're young and they keep it down here. And then when they need it the most, they're like, ah, I don't really need it because look at I have a house. I have all these savings. I have all this stuff. But, you know, all that stuff, you can lose it like that, right? Insurance, as long as you pay your premium, it's going to be there for you. And not to... Um, promote New York life or anything like that. But you know, one of the cool things about them is that they're celebrating their 175th year this year. So they're age 175. There's not a lot of companies that are triple digit age these days, right? And so you have a great number of life insurance companies that are over 100 years old. You have like Northwestern Mutual, you've got, um, I think Penn Mutual as well is over 150 years old. You've got Prudential and you've got Mass Mutual, all of those life insurance companies big name life insurance companies are over 100, over 120 years old. So you, clearly they have the financial strength to withstand all of the different crises things that we've gone through uh, from an economic and financial crisis standpoint in, um, in the United States. So, all right, any questions about terms so far? Ready for whole life? No, yes? Yes. yes. Uh, what time is it? <clears throat> 11.50. Um, okay. I have no relationship to time, as you can already tell. <laughs> Same. <laughs> what is it? You too? Yeah. <laughs> my husband. My husband's always like, um, you're not going to get there in an hour. Why are you staying <laughs> right there at one? And I'm like, I don't know. I, I think it's possible. <laughs> <laughs> I drive a convertible, and I don't have a perm, though. Oh, you don't? Do oh. you, you wrap your hair up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How many, how many people actually pay out whole life? Pardon me? You said 2% get paid. Or was it on term life? Yeah. Or they actually get the, and how about whole life? How many people? Well, I actually, I don't have that number. I should have to, I should look it up. That's a really good question. Um, I don't know, but you know, with whole life there, it's different than term, right? Because with whole life, let's talk about that. Whole life provides protection for the entire life of the insured, right? Whole life. 100 years. The age 100, right? So it provides permanent protection. It has a level face amount. It pays a fixed rate of return inside of the cash value. So it has cash value, right? Uh, it has a level premium. It 
it includes policy loans because of the cash value. Let's draw a picture. Oh my goodness, I'm popular this morning. I don't know how to turn this thing around. Uh, here we have our level face amount up here. Right? This line represents a level face amount. Then we have our cash value, and then we have our net protection. Now, obviously, this is not to scale. Right? I'm not the best artist. I'm working on it, though. And then we have um, this, what, this point, how old am I here? 100. That's right. I'm age 100. So the insurer, right, with the whole life, they're going to take the mortality risk from when you buy the policy all the way up to age 100, right? They know exactly how much premium you charge to according to the face amount and your age and a specific rate of return in this cash value. They know exactly how much to charge you based on all those different factors so that the cash value equals the face amount. See this corner here? The cash value, let me get that one. The cash value equals the face amount. Right here, what age? 100. 100. 100. So you pay your premium, and notice that in the beginning of the, the whole life, usually three to five years, zero cash value. How much cash value? Zero. zero. Why zero? Because it's going to pay for the debt protection, right? The company has the greatest risk in the first three to five years because you've hardly paid anything into it. So then if the insurer dies, then they are responsible for paying the entire death benefit amount. But as they pay their premium, a small portion of it will begin to go towards the cash value and begin to accumulate at a stated rate of return. And all of the money inside the, ca inside the cash value grows how? Tax deferred. Two Fs or two Rs? That was wrong. I can't even see what you're writing. It's very blurry. It's, your screen's very blurry. Yeah, I noticed that the computer or whatever camera you're using when you're close to it is focused, but the screen itself, the whiteboard, is out of focus for most of the presentations on the days that we've logged in because, well, every camera has a different focal length. Ah, and what about when I use the post-its? Is the post-its blurry too, or just the white? Correct. It's pretty much blurry. It's just too far from the camera, or the lens has to be adjusted. All right. Well, we'll adjust it later, <laughs> if that's okay. And then I'll just write a little bigger. Is that right? Yeah, that's better. Every right. time you move, I think it loses the focus a little. I don't, it's weird, because it, I think it's focusing on you. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Maybe I move less. <laughs> That'll be tough for me because I move a lot. I was so, going to say good luck. <laughs> say again? I was joking. I was going to say good luck with that. <laughs> that would be very challenging. All right. So you pay the premium, right? Portion goes in net protection. The other part of it goes in the cash value. A small part of it starts to accumulate in the cash value and it grows with a fixed rate of return on a tax deferred basis. What, what's the importance of tax deferred? Why is tax deferred a big deal? Because you have more money to grow, right? Yeah. <clears throat> so with tax deferred growth, more of the money stays in there. And because it's wrapped in the life insurance package, that's what gives it the tax deferred growth, is this life insurance wrapper around it, right? Is it part of the IRS code? I don't know what, section seven something. And, um, and it basically gives a definition of a life insurance policy. And as long as the life insurance policy pays out in a death benefit, then the policy will be, the death benefit will be received tax-free. All of the money growing inside of the cash value is tax-deferred. 
If you decide to cancel the policy at any time and there's cash value in it, that cash value belongs to who? The IRS. No, to you, the policy owner. The insurance. Yeah. Yes. I, and it's tax free, even if you take it out as a cash value early. So, so let me let me qualify that. So if I decide to cancel the policy and I have a cash value inside of the contract that I'm pulling out of it and I take all of it out, therefore there's no more coverage, then I'm subject to taxation to the amount above the premiums paid. Because the premiums paid and that's your cost basis. Those are after tax dollars. All of the interest and all of the growth inside of the policy above the premiums paid, that's what you thats what you made money on, right? So here's the principle I want you to remember. Anytime you make money, you have to share with all of us. How do you share? Tax. You have to pay your taxes. See, this is what makes these products look so attractive, right? Is because they have these tax deferred um, protection. It's tax deferred inside of the contract. So once I take that life insurance wrapper out and I cancel the policy and I take all the cash, then I may be subject to a taxable event only to the amount above the premiums paid because the amount above the premiums paid is all of the growth. Those, that's your tax basis. Those are the monies that are yet to be taxed. Got it? Because the premiums going in are non-deductible. What are they? Non-deductible. Non yeah. So notice how the nons go hand in hand, right? Non-deductible, non-taxable. Since I'm paying taxes on the monies going in, when the money comes out, I'm not getting taxed on it. But if the money coming out is coming out as a living benefit, then I may be subject to taxation to the amount above the premiums paid in. If it's paid out as a death benefit to my beneficiaries, then it's tax-free. Tax-free right. benefits. Right. Got it? Yeah. That's good. All right. Now, there's different ways to pay into the policy, right? This is life insurance. You die, they pay. They're going to pay out the face amount. Now, you can pay on a continuous premium whole life and pay to age 100. Or you can have what's called a limited pay. And words mean what they say, right? So under a limited payment, that means I'm going to pay for a certain period of time. So if I have a 10 pay, how long am I paying premiums? For 10 years. For 10 years. If I have a 20 pay, how long am I going to pay premiums? So I can't read the first blue line, the longest blue line. Payment, continuous payment. Continuous payment, okay. You're going to pay to age 100. And then we have limited payments. And then the first example is 10 pay, you're going to pay for 10 years. 20 pay, you'll pay for 20 years. Pay up at 65. This is where it gets complicated. I don't know how to, all of this stuff. Well, it just, it's so, let's say, for example, you want to, do you want to pay premiums when you're in retirement? No. No. Why? Right? Because you're, you have limited retirement income. So, or you're on a fixed income or you have your buckets that are, you know, you're getting your income from. You don't have that earned income that you had while you were working. So it might make sense to pay the premium off sooner. The way you can pay the premium off sooner is through a limited payment, like a 10 pay, 20 pay or paid up at 65. A paid up at 65 means that I would pay my premiums up when I reach age 65. Now why 65? Because you know traditionally people retire at age 65. Okay. And I'm going from earned income into all of this unearned income with all these buckets of money that I supposedly save for retirement. Does that make sense? So I want to pay in my income earning year. So your premiums are going to be higher if you choose the limited pay. Of course. Of course, because you're paying for a shorter period of time. So it's gonna look like this. I hope I'm gonna exaggerate it a little bit. But if I have a paid up at 65, check it out. The slope of my cash value is gonna be higher because I'm paying higher premiums, right? I'm paying it off sooner. So instead of growing at the green line, it's gonna grow at the blue line. And check it out. At eight, if this is a paid up at 65, at age 65, I'm paid up as of today. Paid up as of today just means that the premiums are paid off. That's it. But the coverage will continue up to what age? 100. 100. Okay. See how that works? But how does it continue to grow? It's because it's growing up based on the stated rate of return inside of the cash value. So far, so good? Yes. Can anybody you look like you need to ask a question? 
And no, I, I get it now because I've been reading about it and it just doesn't make sense in my head because it, when it says paid up, I'm like, okay, what is, I don't know. Paid now it doesn't make sense. Off. Yeah, paid up just means it's paid off. Oh yeah, okay. Like, what's the difference between a 10-year car loan and a five-year car loan? The time that you pay it off in. And, and am you, I going to have bigger car payments at the five-year or the 10-year? The five-year. Right, but I'm paying it off sooner and then I get my car. And you Same here. Interest. And yeah. I'm not returning the car when it's paid up, though, right? I get to keep the car. Same mm -hmm. thing here. You're gonna, it's paid up, but you're gonna keep the the policy to age 100 because that's when the policy matures. Makes so sense. I, yes. I have a question about this. So in whole life, you have a set death benefit. I know that there's different vehicles such as universal and variable, which were, I don't want to bring into this example, but let's just talk about the whole life with the set death benefit and you've chosen the limited payment and now you're all paid up at 65 and let's say you live till you're 95 and those premiums have paid for that the premiums have they paid that full death benefit or have they paid a portion the premiums that you pay you paid up to age 65 you only paid a portion of it okay but but the premiums let's say you have a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar policy you have the limited payment option that you've chosen to age 65. You haven't paid the insurance company 250,000. No. no, no, but they're giving, but they're giving you that death benefit. Here's my question. Let's say now you live past 65 to 95. You're, you're not eligible for interest accrued on that death benefit because you really haven't paid in 250,000. So you're not entitled to any interest that the companies are accumulating. It's not important, but when you get to the universal and the variable, it does seem that you're entitled to some interest on well, the policies. To check this out, when the insurer dies here, they're only paying out the face amount. That's that I mean. cash value is a portion of the death benefit. That cash value is a portion of the death benefit. So even though my policy is paid up at age 65, if I die at 95, they're going to pay out the $250,000 death benefit. The premiums have already been paid up to age 65. The cash value, see now this is, this is the benefit. This is, so let me so, make the distinction. So the does the cash value Continue to interest and grow. Yes. That's what my question was. Yes. Because okay. anytime somebody holds the money, they make the honey. That's what I say. Whoever's holding the money makes the honey. So they're hold the cash value, they're holding the cash value. The, the cash value is the living benefit of the life insurance policy. There's policy loan provisions that you have access to borrow from the cash value. So if you needed to borrow against it, see that's the difference between cashing it out and then borrowing. See, if I cash it out, I it might have a taxable event. If I borrow it, there is no taxable event. And I just need to make sure I keep the policy to enjoy that benefit. And yeah, even, after the policy, even after the policy is paid up, I can still borrow against the policy. And you don't have to pay it back. It's part of the loan provision. But what happens if I don't pay the loan back is that they're going to take that out of the death benefit when I die so that the beneficiaries will receive the face amount minus the loan plus interest, that becomes the death benefit to the uh, beneficiary. Because I think it's illegal to hold money as an entity without paying interest on it. Just like if you're a landlord, you cannot hold... Uh, now we're going way off subject because okay. I mean... Go I ahead. The criminals, yeah. the banks only give you 0.1%. They might as... That, that's like zero. <laughs> right. That you're getting 02 or 3%. So that, I mean, so that's not really relevant to this, okay. I, but it, it is a principle I want you to remember. And if this is not for you, it's for, for other people because you seem to understand this. But, you know, I, there, these are basic money principles, right? Is that the person holding the money makes the money and they yeah. should be sharing it with you because they're making money work. Like what this is, again, going back to, and I know I keep saying this, but 